माई फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू द वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक एक्चुअली वेरी चॉलेंजिंग टॉपिक इज द बोन ट्यूमर पैथोलॉजी डोंट थिंक दैट बोन ट्यूमर विल आकर्स इन दी एल्डरली पीपल एज एल्डरली पीपल आर मोर प्रोनफुल फॉर कार्सनोमास बट बोन ट्यूमर आर द वन विच विल कैरी हई मॉर्बिडिटी एंड इवन मॉर्टालिटी रेट इन वेरी यंग पॉपुलेशन फॉर एग्जाम्पल आस्ट्रोसार कमा विच आई एम गोइंग टू टेल इन डिटेल इट इज नॉन फॉर ऑकरिंग within 20 years of age itself around 75% of the cases have been recorded below the age of 20 years itself most common tumor is of course the osteosarcoma and we will have a look on these very interesting things like the x ray findings the pathological findings most of the time i will not discuss the details about uh, the treatment modalities as such what i will tell is the common interesting tumors in the bone and the classical grass appearance and microscopical pictures as such whenever the bone tumor comes to us we always interact with the clinicians without the help of uh, radiological support most of the time we will not uh, report the bone tumors individually because there are so many tumors which looks alike under microscope for example if the giant cell containing tumor is there i cannot straight away tell it as giant cell tumor of the bone there are so many bone tumors which will contains giant cell as a component so it's a team work it is a team work where pathologist will discuss with the radiologist radiologist has to provide the radiological findings to us orthopedician has to provide what was the intraoperative findings so it's a team work between the variety of uh, medical fields then only the correct diagnosis can be offered don't think that pathologist can give report just by seeing this slide most of the time it is not so easy to give a diagnosis unless you provide a clinical history you provide a intraoperative findings you provide a radiological support so it becomes really challenging for a pathologist just by seeing a slide uh, giving a diagnosis so there may, it may be a very classical case where it is easy but it is not uh, always true in all the cases in many cases we need to have a differential diagnosis to be kept in our mind and proper diagnosis and correct diagnosis has to be given only with the help of the the clinical support so let us have a look on the various types of bone tumors what is the classical appearances uh, grossly as well as microscopically so what is the cause for bone tumor development why the bone tumors should develop they are the one which will carry very very high morbidity sometimes even mortality if you don't detect them early the most important reason is the ionizing radiation that history you have to take my friends whenever a pediatric uh, cases will come with a bony swelling always ask a history of the irradiation especially patient might have received the radiation therapy for some other purpose but now coming with a bony tumor may be because of the radiation induced the hazard so that ionizing radiation is very important cause for the bone tumor development there are so many conditions which will predispose us for the uh, bony tumors for example pejors disease of a bone we have one more disease remember pejors disease of a breast also is there which indicates underlying uh, you know breast carcinomas so this is pejors disease of a bone as such which is a Uh, pre malignant condition can give rise to the osteosarcomas fibrous dysplasia yes, yes again one more uh, uh, benign reactive condition but it can even give rise to the osteosarcomas most importantly it is the genes remember the genes will play very important role especially it is a retinoblastoma gene you know any child who has developed the retinoblastoma say at the age of around 2 years and you do the enucleation of the eyeball warn the parents that if the child develops a bony swelling later on in the life period bring the child very early as early as possible because osteosarcoma and retinoblastoma both can be due to the rb gene mutations so retinoblastoma gene you have to evaluate you have to think in all the cases of uh, uh, retinoblastoma so you have to carefully follow up the patient for very very long period so if at all the patient the child develops any bony swellings it, you should think about osteosarcomas in these cases variety of syndromes are there like uh, gardner syndrome olier syndrome so along with the intestinal polyps and even other uh, clinical uh, features so you have to also think about uh, it may be a rare case of uh, syndrome so there are a lot of genes will get mutated most of the time it is the tumor suppressor gene in activation but in uh, certain cases we may not find any obvious causes 
Let us have a look on details about the bone tumors. In general, they constitute around 0.5% of the case death. Comparatively, you know, if you compare to the soft tissue tumors, the bone tumors are rare and they could be a primary bone tumor. Sometimes it could be secondary. In the sense, the bone tumors could be even metastatic tumor deposits. For example, breast carcinomas. Usually, we know that it goes to the axillary group of lymph nodes. That is in the initial stage. But later on, it can go even to the bones. It will have a osteolytic metastasis. Prostatic carcinoma is very much known for osteoblastic metastatic deposits. So, even in fact, metastatic tumor deposits are very, very common, especially in the vertebral area, in the vertebral collapse, and it can be due to the metastatic tumor deposits. So, remember, primary bone tumors are very common in the young, like osteosarcoma, less than 20 years of age. So, very commonly, they are malignant tumors of the bone, they are primary tumors. Whereas, secondary are very common in the elderly people like brush carcinoma deposits into the bones, kidney carcinoma, renal cell carcinoma again very high metastatic potential, thyroid carcinoma of which one? Yes, it is the follicular carcinoma, not the papillary, it is a follicular carcinoma of the thyroid, again known for bony metastasis, lung cancers, yes, remember small cell carcinomas, common cell carcinomas, the adenocarcinomas, especially true for oat cell carcinoma, that is small cell carcinoma of the lung, having highest malignant potential, it will have a very high tendency to go to the bones and even to the various other organs. As I told elderly male, you have to always think about prostatic carcinomas could be the important cause of the secondary deposits. Some could be the bone marrow neoplasms itself like multiple myeloma. Again, it is a tumor of the plasma cells and it involves the bone marrow. And leukemias and lymphomas, yes, whenever we see the small blue round cells, so again you have to have a variety of differential diagnosis in mind starting from lymphomas as such. So it could be having sarcoma, it could, it could be so many things. So there are so many entities, neuroblastomas especially in a children, again it mimics like a small blue round cell tumor, having sarcoma again. Then lymphomas, variety of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas will have a small blue round cell appearance on the microscopy and even we have small cell variant of osteosarcoma. So whenever we see small blue round cell deposited in the bone marrow, that is really a diagnostic challenge. We have to do several panel of immunohistochemistry chemistry markers to conclude what is the primary. Tumor like conditions of the bone. So they are not actually true tumors, but a tumor like lesions. So bony cyst, simple bone cyst, again common. Unusual bone cyst, we don't know why it occurs. It is of unknown origin. Again, ABC are very, very common tumors. Unusual bone cyst known for extensive hemorrhage and we will see giant cells in this lesion also. Fibrous dysplasias, fibrosis lesions, again it is a tumor like condition. Eosinophilic granuloma is a type of uh, Langerhans histiocytosis. Again it could be very aggressive tumor, Langerhans uh, histiocytosis but benign counterpart is the eosinophilic granuloma but even it can turn into aggressive form. Osteochondromas, probably they represent a hematomas where there is an excessive growth of the cartilaginous component over the bone. So again, these are all the examples of the tumor-like conditions of the bone. So let us have a look on the primary classification, the important primary bone tumors as such. So these are the ones which are important, but remember the list is very, very big, my friends, but these are the ones which are commonly expected in the exams. It could be bone producing uh, tumors, bone producing tumors like Osteoma, osteoastoma, and osteoblastoma. So these are the benign malignant counterpart is the osteosarcoma. So this is one what I am going to tell. There is the most important uh, bone producing or osteoid producing tumor. We also call it as osteogenic sarcoma. Both are one and the same. Cartilage producing tumors, benign tumors like chondroma, osteochondromas, chondromyxoid fibroma, chondroblastomas. So these are the benign tumors. The malignant counterpart is the chondrosarcomas. Again, very common tumor, especially in the hip bones. Then we have miscellaneous tumors where uh, we don't know exactly the uh, the origin of the cells, especially giant cell tumor, the cell of origin is not known. The most important tumor is, you have to remember, having sarcoma again, very commonly arises from the diaphysis. Actually, the bone tumors is quite easy if you remember from which particular area they are arising from. For example, epiphyseal tumors are the giant cell tumors and unusual bone cysts. That means we have epiphysis, metaphysis and diaphysis. Epiphysially located the tumors are giant cell tumors and unusual bone cyst. Metaphysial, I am telling only few of those. There are plenty of other tumors also. Metaphysial tumors, mainly it's a 
uh, osteosarcomas and even chondrosarcomas fibrous dysplasia also can arise from the metaphysis diaphysis you have to remember always the having sarcoma so and even osteochondroma so have a look at this diagram we have three portions right epiphysis metaphysis and diaphysis diaphysis is the shaft of the bone so depending on the location sometimes it will very helpful for the radiologist and the pathologist to tell what it could be and we have a lot of uh, radiological findings we will see later on what are the radiological findings so the in the long bones we divide the tumors into epiphyseal origin or a metaphyseal origin or a diaphyseal origin epiphyseal classic example is the giant cell tumor the metaphyseal classical example is the osteosarcoma and the diaphyseal classical example is the ewing sarcoma they are the one which i am going to discuss actually in detail let us have a look at uh, some of the benign tumors then followed by malignant tumors benign tumor very common is the again osteoma which is a bone producing tumor most common site is the craniofacial in location it could be a hamartoma or it could be a probably a reactive process we don't know exactly why it happens and it is actually not a true tumor histologically it consists of oven bone and as well as lamellar bone and it closely resembles the normal bone so histology is uh, difficult again to diagnose these uh, osteomas we need a radiological assistance to diagnose these osteomas so remember one of the syndrome as i told previously syndromes are classically seen in certain cases uh, patient with the multiple osteomas you have to think about uh, gastrointestinal polyps can be there patient is also prone for these polyps can turn into malignant patient can also develop a colon cancer and even skin tumors and even patient can also develop the osteochondromas and it is transmitted in the autosomal dominant fashion osteoma we have one more most painful tumor osteoid osteoma they will commonly ask in the exams it is the most painful tumor and it is all because of the it is able to secrete uh, prostaglandins so this is a tumor which is you know they will use the aspirin as a treatment of choice but as such you cannot cure the uh, tumor as such you have to resect it out we have a central needles in this particular tumor it consists of central vascular spaces that is surrounded by interlacing reactive trabecula of the bone so unless you remove the this particular central needles the the pain will not be uh, relieved so that's a uh, thing about uh, osteoid osteoma so that's an interesting thing about the osteoid osteoma so it's a benign tumor more commonly seen in the second decades in the males usually 1 to 2 cm in size and usually seen in the cortex of the femur or the tibia so therapy is the medical line of treatment initially but resection of needles is the most curative treatment that should be followed by bony graft bone should be grafted at that particular site have a look at this graft specimen this is a central needles so this is one which is secreting a plenty of prostaglandins so that's why analgesics will be used to relieve the pain of this particular tumor osteoid osteoma so this is a central vascular spaces will be there surrounded by this uh, interlacing uh, lacy network of uh, osteoid will be there yes we will come to the very interesting uh, bone tumor osteosarcoma so you can also call it as osteogenic sarcoma it is a common primary cancer of the bone very commonly it is seen at the very young age group per under 10 to 25 years of age it is quite rare in the later age whenever you see in the later age you should have also the differential diagnosis it could be a second route to the previous irradiation or even buzzard's disease of the bone which is said to be the preneoplastic can give rise to the osteosarcomas you should always remember retinoblastoma gene is important gene that is get mutated with the osteosarcomas the most common location is actually the long bones anywhere in the body long bones the metaphysis of the long bones but very commonly it is seen in the lower legs in the knee joint so the area around the knee joint that is especially the lower end of a femur or upper end of a tibia so most commonly osteosarcomas are located around the knee joint but any long long bone for that matter for example upper end of humerus humerus and even uh, the ends of the uh, radius and ulna so they also can be get affected but most common site is the around the knee joint patient like come with a tender uh, bony enlargement there can be associated pain and mass will be there sometimes it could be so destructive and what you will see is the malignant mesenchyma lesions so this is cells which will show all the features of anaplasia and there will be extensive irregular lace like osteoid so histologically this is the diagnostic actually formation of osteoid 
that is tumor osteoid we call it as tumor osteoid should be there to diagnose the cases of osteosarcoma so unless you see osteoid formation in the osteosarcoma it is very difficult to tell it is a osteosarcoma so along with the osteoid formation it is known for extensive areas of hemorrhage and necrosis so grass specimen will show extensive areas of hemorrhage and necrosis it is known for infiltration it destroys the local tissues it infiltrates into the local tissues that means it first erodes the periosteum that is the bony uh, coat bony layer the outermost layer of the bone so periosteum is get elevated and it forms very peculiar uh, triangle due to the elevation of the periosteum we call it as codmans triangle so radiologically the most interesting point is the codmans triangle due to the elevation of the periosteum that will take place and peculiarly there can be a formation of osteoid can give rise to the sunray appearance so two important radiological findings in the osteosarcoma codmans triangle sunray appearance so remember those two so they are very classical uh, findings x-ray findings in the osteosarcoma that's why we always ask please provide a x-ray that we request the clinicians or the radiologist or the orthopedicians so once we have a radiological support then we correlate the findings in the histopathology and we issue the reports this osteoid which is formed may or may not be calcified and most of the time if the tumor is very bulky enough we always follow the preoperative chemotherapy that is followed by surgical dissection so preoperative chemotherapy will reduce the bulk of a tumor that makes the surgeon too easy to resect the the tumor area five year survival is around 60% provided you have diagnosed the trick case early and you have treated it appropriately so have a look at the grass specimens extensive areas of hemorrhage and necrosis the bone is the periosteum is get elevated it is known for local destruction so if it is occurring over the knee joint it can even infiltrate the periosteum is the one which will get first infiltrate inside it can even infiltrate the medullary cavities and outside it can even infiltrate the skeletal muscle bundles around the uh, knee joint and even neurovascular bundles even the nerve bundles can be get infiltrated by the tumor so a lot of compression can occur over the around the tumor area so classical x-ray findings of the osteosarcoma so this is elevation of the periosteum we call it as periosteal reaction so this is how the periosteal reaction will appear it appears very very thick and you can make out that there is a space so this is elevation of a periosteum and it can result in the formation of the codmans triangle and this is what i told because of the extensive deposition of the osteoid it can give rise to the sunray appearance what we see pathologist under microscope we see extensive deposition of this uh, osteoid tumor osteoid and the cells will show classical all features of anaplasia remember again we take osteosarcoma to demonstrate the features of anaplasia for the students the cells will show pleomorphism, marked degree of pleomorphism, all the features of anaplasia, high NC ratio, bizarre appearing mitotic figures and even bizarre appearing tumor giant cells are seen. Extensive areas of hemorrhage and extensive areas of necrosis also most important for diagnosing the uh, osteosarcoma. So we also count for the mitotic activity, how many mitotic figures are there per high power field. So all these features along with the extensive lace like osteoid are important for diagnosing the osteosarcoma. So this is classical osteosarcoma. but we have so many subtypes, histological subtypes of osteosarcoma. Just to name a few, the telangiectatic osteosarcoma, where you see plenty of blood vessels. We have a small cell osteosarcomas, clear cell type. There are so many types of uh, osteosarcomas which needs a further investigations like immunohistochemistry chemistry sometimes to confirm the diagnosis. So this is how we represent the osteosarcoma. Marked degree of anaplasia, tumor giant cells and even osteoclastic type of giant cells will be there. If the osteoclastic giant cells are plenty, we call it as giant cell rich osteosarcoma. That's one more type of osteosarcoma. So bizarre mitotic activity, high mitosis and osteoid. This is how the osteoid will appear. Pink homogeneous eosinophilic lace like appearance. So this is how the osteoid will appear. So extensive areas of hemorrhage, extensive areas of necrosis are also part and parcel to diagnose. They are integral part of diagnosis in the tumor. So you should take also sections from these bone tumors. So one more thing you have to remember, all the bone tumors, any bony tissue what we receive to the histopathology lab, we will decalcify the tissue. So decalcification where we use the concentrated acids like uh, combination of nitric acid and even formic acid. So because if you don't decalcify the tissue, it will damage the knife of a 
cutting a microtome so knife will be get damaged and we have to discard that knife so that's why most of the bony lesions we cut it uh, and we will put it in the decalcifying agent either for one day two days then we will feel the consistency if it is uh, decalcified then only we will process for the automatic tissue processor then only we will prepare the paraffin blocks so that is a decalcification technique for the bony lesions next we have a osteochondromatosis very common what is the common name for osteochondromatosis yes exostosis that's the one which we commonly use in the clinical settings it could be single or it could be multiple whenever you see multiple osteochondromas then you have to think about the hereditary cases they can have other uh, associated anomalies also so it's a mushroom shaped bony projections and usually seen over the lateral aspect of the cartilage joints and rarely it can even give rise to the malignant counterpart that is chondrosarcomas so have a look at the classical appearance so it grows towards the growing end of the bone so like this so it's a bony outgrowth covered by the cartilaginous cap this is the one what we see under uh, grass specimen there is a bony tumor that is covered by cartilaginous cap so this is one very classical appearance of the osteochondromas same thing we appreciate under the microscope also there is a bone is here there is medullary fat is here and here is the cartilaginous cap so this is what is required for diagnosing the osteochondroma exostosis chondromas are also called as enchondromas they are benign occur at any age either could be single or multiple whenever you see multiple you should always think about the hereditary causes often involves the small bones of the hands and feet that you have to remember small bones of hand and feet the cartilaginous tumor can arise well demarcated and there will be a mature cartilage so this is one of our case showing the enchondromas in the foot so it can also occur over the hands enchondromas they will have again this kind of a soap bubble appearance so soap bubble appearance is seen in so many conditions it is not only limited to the giant cell tumor of the bone so here is again uh, totally the bone is get eroded here yes what we see is the mature cartilage see these are chondrocytes and they are uh, you know in the lacune what you call as chondrocytes in the lacune so this is a class classical appearance of the enchondroma so it is a mature cartilage lobules of hyaline cartilage will be seen there can be associated a foci of mixoid degeneration sometimes even foci of calcification and endochondral ossification can also be takes place if may be quite similar but whenever you see the features of anoplasia then you should think that enchondroma may give rise to the chondrosarcomas but most of the time the chondrosarcomas are uh, de novo in origin there is a increase risk of course there is a risk of development of the chondrosarcomas for these cases whenever you see multiple uh, exostosis think about uh, you know the olliers syndrome so multiple enchondromatosis are seen either one side or the both side of the body we have one more syndrome mafosa syndrome here you see multiple bone enchondromatosis and hemangiomas of the soft tissues the very important malignant uh, tumor that is produces the cartilage so cartilage producing tumor is the chondrosarcoma more commonly seen in the older adults like 60 years of age and the site you have to remember it is the pelvic bones and even pectoral girdles so the flat bones are the one which are commonly get affected sometimes even the ribs and the spine so it is most common again to the next to the osteosarcoma it is cartilage producing uh, malignant tumor so it's again highly aggressive tumor it erodes it invades the soft tissues it is also known for lungs metastasis remember sarcomas when you use the word they will have a tendency to metastasize to the lungs why because hematogenous spread so most important whenever you diagnose the osteosarcoma you should also one x-ray you will take say if it is a leg tumor you will take a x-ray of a leg second you should never forget to take a x-ray of the lungs because they are known for metastatic spread to the lungs so it is a hematogenous route of uh, spread so you will see multiple punched out uh, cannon ball appearance you should think about the uh, cannon ball appearance is think it suggests that metastatic deposits already has taken place in the lung so osteosarcomas chondrosarcomas all sarcomas most of the sarcomas are known for hematogenous spread so this is one of our case of chondrosarcoma which is arising from the lower end of the femur as such but most common site is the pelvic bones that you have to remember so let us have a look on how to differentiate uh, osteosarcoma from the chondrosarcoma osteosarcoma remember it is a young age of onset 10 to 25 years of age chondrosarcoma a little bit elderly 40 or 60 years of age most common site is the long bones for osteosarcoma like uh, femur lower end of a femur is the common site whereas 
Chondrosarcomas mainly it's a flat bones like pelvic bones. Axial skeleton is most commonly involved. And osteosarcomas are sensitive to chemotherapy, but chondrosarcomas they need aggressive treatment. They are not much sensitive to the chemotherapeutic drugs. Let us have a look on the Ewing sarcoma, one more important tumor, rare occurs in the young population around 10 to 20 years. Males are commonly des gets affected. Diaphysis, that's the one what you have to remember in the long bones and even pelvic bones can also be get involved. Histopathology is very curious about having sarcoma. It is a type of small blue round cell tumor. So you'll see uniform population of small blue round cell tumor, but they are classically positive for PAS. That point you have to remember. Having sarcoma, whenever you see, you have to do the PAS stain, periodic acid shift stain. So glycosin will be positive in these uh, cases. So that's the one what we routinely do for Ewing sarcoma cases. And classically, they will have a peculiar X-ray finding. That is what we call it as onion skinning of the appearance, onion skin appearance of the on the X-ray. So it is due to the translocation 11 to 22, but other translocations and even various other mutations can occur. But you have to remember translocation 11 22 occurs in the Ewing's sarcoma. Prognosis is not so good. Five year survival is less uh, less than 10 percent with the surgery and radiotherapy, but with the adjacent uh, chemotherapy, it can raise up to 40 percent. So classical one more case of our Ewing's sarcoma where a patient has presented with a bony fracture. It is a pathological fracture. So we suspected pathological fracture in this case and uh, did FNSC followed by uh, aspiration, followed by even histological biopsy. So X-ray will show classical uh, onion skinning appearance. So this is classical onion skin appearance in the Ewing sarcoma. That is very commonly they again ask in the MCQs. So they are small blue round cell tumor. You have to remember that they are positive for the PAS and translocation of the Ewing sarcoma. You have to remember 11 to 22 translocation will take place. One of the last and interesting tumor I want to tell is the giant cell tumor of the bone. A classical example is the osteosarcoma. Is giant cell tumor is a benign or a malignant? It is benign, but it is having highest potential to turn into malignant. Although it is benign, it is known for even recurrences. If you excise the giant cell tumor, you should tell the patient that it can recur, although it is benign, so careful follow-up should be done. So giant cell tumor are very commonly seen in the epiphyseal origin and they gives a classical appearance is the soap bubble appearance, where most common site is the lower end of a radius. That is the most common site, but even a uh, variety of other sites can be also in, involved, including even the small bones of the hands and feet. So the lytic lesion, so they are lytic lesion and they will have a more of osteoclastic activity that gives rise to the soap bubble appearance. Most common sites again around the knee, elbow, ankle, most common is the again lower end of uh, radius. Recurrence is common, so that's point you have to remember, although they are benign, they are known for recurrences. Classical soap bubble appearance at the lower end of a radius, this is how it appears, known as soap bubble appearance. But remember, soap bubble appearance is seen in for so many cases. FNAC shows high cellularity smears and it shows a very good number of uh, giant cells. But remember my friends, there are so many bony tumors which will contain the giant cells. So that makes the diagnosis is very, really challenging. So what are the lesions where you see the giant cells? So it could be fibrous dysplasia, it could be aneurysmal bone cyst. Then we have a giant cell rich osteosarcomas, we have a classical osteoclastomas and we have brown tumor of parathyroid lesion. So hyperparathyroidism that results in the brown tumor of the bone that can also have a plenty of osteoclastic type of giant cells. So giant cell containing lesions are so many. So you need to have a thorough clinical approach. So you should take into account the radiological opinion to conclude the diagnosis. The peculiarity of a giant cell tumor under microscopy you have to remember. So there are two types of cells, right? Spindle cells, they are stromal cells and we have osteoclastic type of giant cells, which is neoplastic. Remember, it is a stromal cells which are said to be the true neoplastic component of the giant cells, not the osteoclastic cells. So that point you have to remember. So here stromal cells, so these are the stromal cells are the ones which are true neoplastic cells. So it is actually the osteoplastic giant cells, they are non-neoplastic component. They are not the neoplastic component, they are non-neoplastic component. But if you carefully see the nucleus of uh, giant cells, osteoclastic giant cells and that of a stromal cells, it is always appears the same. It always appears same. The spindle cell nucleus and nucleus of uh, osteoclastic giant cells always appears same. But remember, it is the stromal cells which we will always look carefully. If at all it is showing any features of anoplasia like 
including a mitotic activity, then we label it as malignant GLCN tumor. So that point you have to remember, it is a stromal component cells which will give a lot of importance, not for the osteoplastic type of these giant cells. So this is uh, again diagrammatical representation. Have a look here. These are stromal cells and same nucleus is here for the osteoclastic type of giant cells and we will give much more importance for these stromal cells and not for the osteoclastic giant cells. Yes, bone is also known for variety of metastatic tumor deposits either it could be brush carcinomas or prostatic carcinomas, lung carcinomas uh, we have so many tumors can metastasize to the lung. So, this is a case of osteolytic metastasis. You can see osteolytic lesions, multiple, multiple osteolytic lesions. So, very commonly breast carcinomas. Osteoblastic metastasis, you have to remember, mainly due to the prostatic carcinomas. But rarely even uh, breast carcinomas can be osteoblastic as such. So, it is very interesting to learn the pathological findings in the variety of bone tumors. Not only that, you have to also remember the various radiological findings. So, Equally, they are also important. So, we will expect MCQs based on the pathology findings and based on the radiological findings. Thank you.